The following episode features a historic article from the Nebraska History Magazine. This article may reflect the language and attitudes of its time, and while it offers valuable insight into the past, may contain expressions or viewpoints that are outdated or offensive by today's standards. Any outdated terms do not reflect the current views or perspectives of History Nebraska. Welcome to the Nebraska History Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Goforth. Each episode, we explore articles written and published in the Nebraska History Magazine. On this episode, we look back at an article published in the fall 2023 issue by John Manette. Today, let's look back at the collapse of Cheyenne supremacy in the Great Plains. By the late 1860s, most Central Plains non-native residents were occupied with what reconstruction would mean for their lives. Optimism for empire building in the unsettled areas of new states like Kansas and Nebraska occupied much of their attention. John S. Casement and Thomas Durant were determined to reach the Pacific with the Union Pacific Railroad systems. With a surge in settlement westward onto the plains after the Civil War, an opportunity for free land under the Federal Homestead Act, effective in 1863, few prospective homesteaders cared to notice that the fertile lands of the Central Plains were still Indian country, as confirmed by Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. Several thousand of these native peoples, including Sioux, Northern and Southern Cheyennes, Pawnees, Odos, Kiowas, Comanches, and others were also residents of the Central Plains and harbored hopes and ambitions of their own. Of greatest concern to white authorities in both Kansas and Nebraska were the Cheyennes. Little noticed was a decree in 1866 made by those indigenous nations about 150 miles west of Topeka in north-central Kansas at the site of an artesian outpouring known as Wakanda Springs, near today's Cocker City. The spring was sacred to many indigenous people, especially the Hotamativo Band of the Southern Cheyennes. Settlers moved west past the sacred springs after the Cheyennes declared a, quote, deadline along the latitude of Salina, Kansas, and extending north into Nebraska, where the rich ecosystem of the tall grass prairies began to transcend to the mid- and short grass prairies. The Cheyennes declared they would not allow white settlement to cross into this region past the deadline. North-central Kansas and south-central Nebraska was one of the last gray biomes for the American bison and defined life for several bands of the Sisistas, the Cheyennes, and their Arapaho allies. The Cheyennes' dominant dogmen warrior society also pledged to defend this overlapping hunting range on both sides of Kansas and Nebraska against the Pawnees. The white man's geographic state line meant nothing to them. Renewal of white expansion began by 1866, together with environmental reformation and a more arid geography as one moves west into the region, influenced all what came next. Most unconcerned with the fertile, well-watered eastern third of Kansas and the populating Omaha region during the border conflict of the Civil War, U.S. leaders mostly dismissed these conditions of the Central Plains. They minimized how indigenous people depended on the land not being restructured by white agriculture and industry. Historians of the American West have become aware of how indigenous nations viewed these geographical and changing environmental factors brought on by white agricultural expansion. But historians have not fully tapped these factors as triggers for war and violence between the United States and the native populations on the Great Plains. According to environmental historian Dan Flores, scholars should search below the, quote, standard events of war and treaties to ponder human interaction with environmental landscapes. Doing so, he argues, would provide better understanding of Indian and Euro-American relations in the American West, as well as the attendant physiological factors that helped explain how geographical change precipitated such refusal of natives and whites to reach accommodation. Dramatic transformation that could actuate violence did occur in areas of the American West, such as Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado of the 1860s, areas that underwent rapid infusions of white settlers into regions still fairly populated by native hunters. The resulting well-known violence is more than a two-dimensional story of military activity. The purpose of this essay is to examine Southern Cheyenne perspectives of those factors through cultural, spiritual, and ecological belief system that affected their resistance of the late 1860s. 
These worldviews and the resulting aggressive responses consisted of more than simply protecting Buffalo Range for economic substances. The advancement of the Union Pacific Eastern Division Railroad, later renamed Kansas Pacific, into central Kansas and the Union Pacific Main Line across Nebraska, respectively precipitated war between the Cheyennes, principally the militant dogmen warrior society. White settlement by 1868 had progressed far up the tributary valleys of the Kansas River like crooked fingers. Migration in Nebraska's Blue River Valley below the North Platte increased at the same time. No rigid frontier line then existed on the plains in the limited Ternesian sense. Wide spaces between the divides still harbored many buffalo and presented a patchwork of farms mixed with native hunting lands, a landscape in process of sudden change from one form of economic use to a culturally transformative mix that historian Henry Nash Smith and other scholars have called quote-unquote middle landscapes. 1866 to 1868 was a pivotal time in the formation of these middle landscapes. This alteration of the physical and cultural environmental portrait of the region and the upheaval it wrought presents an important example of the narrative power of place in the history of the West. With the ensuing peace following the 1867 Medicine Lodge Treaty that ended hostilities that year, the federal government formally apologized for the atrocities of the Sand Hill Creek Massacre, made financial restitution to the Cheyennes and Arapahoes, and established carefully defined reservation boundaries. The treaty makers told the Cheyennes and the Arapahoes they could continue to hunt between the Arkansas and the Platte until the buffalo were gone. But these verbal promises never appeared in the final document sent to Congress for ratification. The treaty provided no solid assurances of protecting these lands for the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Sioux from enemy Pawnees and white expansion. But for the natives, often victims of misinterpreted words and intent by the interpreters, treaties were for agreeing to, quote, purchase the Indians' promise of peace in exchange for gifts and annuities distributed to individuals through the conduit of tribal leadership structures, and not for land secessions to whites. Beneath the surface, however, these treaties had much to do with landscape, Metaphors in reasoning from the perspectives of two diverse societies produced competing views of what treaties really meant, because each visualized the natural landscape through a different cultural lens. Therefore, treaties held very different reasoned understandings. Forcing privatization of small land holdings would quickly destroy traditional tribal economies, which were based on collectively held resources and tied closely to a spiritualism based on relationships between man and his larger environment, including plants and animals. A drastic agricultural erasing of grasslands would completely sever that spiritual relationship and eventually force the Cheyennes into a new type of capitalist market economy and a means of production measured by individual family farm units, a system most Plains Indians neither understood nor desired. And with the near extinction of the buffalo in the 1870s, the Central Plains tribes would have no choice but to submit to this government objective of uplifting reform, ordained by President Ulysses S. Grant's peace policy and the largely Quaker-led Indian reform movement. During the Medicine Lodge peace talks, participant Buffalo Chief asserted the uncompromising Cheyenne viewpoint, quote, We are willing, when we desire, to live as you do, to take your advice about settling down. But, until then, we will take our chances. We never claimed any land south of the Arkansas, but that country between the Arkansas and the Platte is ours. End quote. Even in the years following the Dawes Severality General Allotment Act of 1887 that offered private land holdings to Indians, many indigenous people still could not grasp the logic of why whites believed that land privatization would benefit Indians. Indeed, within the psychology governing their worldviews, this system did not benefit Indians simply because, for them, it was illogical. As treaty councils, whites never intended to accept 
how native logic was so closely interrelated spiritually with Western landscapes, they wished to make them into landed farmers. But historians and ethnologists today are starting to corroborate 19th century interviews with natives using oral history recorded and or written by tribal descendants. These early interviews, especially by white ethnologists, consist of the original sources of history from native viewpoints. So what were the Cheyenne's cultural worldviews that whites did not or refused to acknowledge, and how did it affect Cheyenne decisions to go to war again after the Medicine Lodge Treaty from 1868? For the Cheyennes, their prophet, Sweet Medicine, long ago in the Black Hills, had defined the mutual economic and spiritual nature of the world of the Great Plains by sanctifying the four directions of the universe and the elements within it. The earth like the sky and the air, and even the water, were much alike. One breathed the air as a universal component. Water was a communal element, as was the land itself. The plants and animals within that environment had unique relationships among themselves, the earth and the humans. Hunters must perform rituals before harvest if the resources placed there for their use by the Maheho, the creator, were to endure. They must ask permission of the buffaloes to kill them for food, or the animals might not be present at a future time. To alter these relationships by drastically and permanently changing the sacredness of the Cheyenne spiritual universe in physical ways through subdivision and the plow was sacrilege to this belief system. Well-defined boundaries had no relationship to native quote-unquote geospiritual boundaries and neutral zones of intertribal convergence that could shift through wars of expansion with Indian enemies. But these neutral zones could never change spatially in terms of how humans use those contested lands economically and how all Indian peoples regarded them incorporeally. Defined absolute borders on a map were considered a Euro-American contrivance. The visual landscape itself thus comprised a fundamental element of Cheyenne cosmology as well as their economic base. The government mostly ignored this epistemological path of belief. It insisted instead that the Indian universe would soon vanish and the Indians must therefore inevitably take up the white man's way of life before the actual physical transition occurred. But it was difficult for the Cheyenne to grasp that futuristic concept when enough of their natural world still remained. Before white settlement, the landscape of the Central Plains served as both metaphor and mediator between humans and Maheo, and it still did at the time of the Medicine Lodge Treaty in 1867, though it was beginning to change because of the natural resource depletion. What was the physical landscape of the Cheyennes in the mid-19th century? How was it progressively threatened long before the 1860s and, after Medicine Lodge, rapidly and irreversibly altered in northern-central Kansas and south-central Nebraska? Up to about 1850, the prairie was a complex environmental transition zone of diverse grasses that was best utilized by the semi-nomadic Cheyennes and Arapahoes, who ranged seasonally over a wide area extending roughly from present-day Salina, Kansas and Lincoln, Nebraska, through the high plains of Colorado. West of this region, the land consisted of a mixture of long grasses and mid-grasses, bluestem and grama. These were the eastern buffalo ranges when bands of Cheyenne hunters began arriving from the Black Hills in the 1830s at the latest. To the east, in the blue stem tall grass prairies of eastern Kansas and Nebraska, lived the Osages, the Odos, the Kaws, and bands of semi agricultural Pawnees along what became the Kansas and Nebraska border. To the west, Past the 100th meridian, the high plains stretched ever upward to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains along the Colorado Front Range. This was Arapaho country. The high plains consisted primarily of short grass grama and buffalo grass, giving way to wheat grass and needle grass in the extreme northwest part of Kansas and into Colorado and Nebraska. Traversing these lands from east to west in Kansas were riparian belts of northern floodplain forest along the Blue, Republican, Saline, Solomon, South Platte, 
Arkansas, and Smoky Hill Rivers. North of Kansas, in Nebraska, was the Platte River Riparian Belt, where white travelers came by the thousands in the 1840s. Average annual precipitation ranged from 30 inches, not far east of Salina and Lincoln, to about 16 inches in the far west, even less in times of drought, which tended to be cyclical on the central and high plains. The Cheyennes, who came south from the Black Hills in the 1830s, did not all eventually arrive on these plains to hunt buffalo. Many came to trade at Bent Fort near today's La Juanta, Colorado in 1833, and Fort Laramie in the New Wyoming Territory in 1868. Many were followers of Council Chief Yellow Wolf from the Hetayaneo and the Osiamana clans. William Bent married Owl Woman, daughter of White Thunder, keeper of the sacred arrows that ensured prosperity among the Cheyenne people. In 1840, William Bent and Yellow Wolf's followers negotiated a peace with the Kiowas and Northern Comanche. The Comanches moved to the Buffalo Ranges south of the Arkansas, while Yellow Wolf's Cheyennes recognized hunting ranges from the Arkansas north to the south and eventually North Platte Rivers. Yellow Wolf's people had become the Southern Cheyennes. Between 1840 and 1849, trade in prime winter buffalo robes and other pelts between the Cheyennes and Bent St. Vrain Company flourished. By the 1840s, the Cheyennes' annual economic routines were predictable. During the late spring, when the mid-grasses in central Kansas sprouted, the natives would move to their semi-mobile summer camps along the Blue, Saline, Solomon, and Smoky Hill Rivers to pasture their horses. Perhaps they had practiced fire ecology the prior fall by burning off dry grasses so that the new vegetation would sprout earlier growth in the spring. Here, the men hunted a variety of game including buffalo, deer, antelope, elk, small mammals, and birds. But... In the fall, the mid-grasses would dry, and their nitrogen-rich nutrients would migrate underground into the lengthy, sod-forming rhizomes of the root systems and would be unavailable to both buffalo and horse herds until spring. In autumn, the Cheyennes would follow the buffalo west to extreme western Kansas and Nebraska. There, the short grasses would cure in the dry, cold temperatures and retain nourishment above ground locked within the dried foliation that was available to grazing animals in the winter. When bitter winter weather arrived, the Indians would break up into smaller groups to sustain life with more limited resources. They would seek winter camps below wind-sheltered bluffs, larger river bottoms, or stream-cut banks while trying to keep their horse herds alive on the bark and twigs of cottonwood trees. During the winter, Cheyenne women cured and tanned buffalo hides while men made arrows and lances for use during warmer months. During heavy snow cover, they might remain in their lodges for long periods of time. As such times, portions of their horse herds invariably perished in the face of these harsh elements. The people of Yellow Wolf were fortunate in that their winter ranges in the southerly Arkansas Valley near Bent's Fort were more temperate and snow-free than the lands to the north along the Republican and Platte. Large herds of buffalo often wintered along the upper Arkansas with the Indians, a sign that Maheo favored their interrelationship and blessed their mutual use of the land. Even before the advent of the fur and hide trade, the southern Cheyennes had established themselves as middlemen in the horse trade. They moved animals up from the Comanche and Spanish-Mexican borders to the northern tribes, exchanging them for European firearms and other goods originating in the upper Midwest and Canada. Anthropologists have estimated that the Central Plains could sustain from 5 to 13 horses per person. For the Cheyennes, the higher per capita numbers were the norm because of their trade role and as a means for compensation for winter attrition on the high plains. As commercial traders, the Cheyennes may even have stretched their herd numbers beyond the limit, accounting for close to 40,000 animals at any given time. Finding suitable grass for large numbers of pastured horses was a major reason the Cheyennes traveled long distances seasonally. The other great motivation was the need for firewood, which took them some distance from Kansas and Nebraska along the Pawnee Trail. During pre-contact times, the elected Cheyenne council chiefs, who were often also the heads of extended family bands, tried always to ensure the welfare of their people and horses by regulating the semi-annual movements of the villages. 
By the early 1800s, their roles expanded to include the duty of trade broker with other tribes to facilitate horse trading agreements. With the American fur trade on the high plains in the 1830s and 1840s, these chiefs also became trade facilitators with whites. Yellow Wolf was one of the first, moving southward to the Arkansas River and forging the historic trade alliance with Bent St. Vrain and Company and Fort Lupton. Thus, it would seem the 1830s and 1840s were a period of great prosperity for the Cheyennes, but such was not the case as their dependent landscapes suffered a slow deterioration by the 1840s, if not before. As buffalo numbers decreased with commercial demand for robes in the east and beaver became scarce in the mountains, the fur trade declined sharply by 1849. Diminishing returns based on the commercialization of non-renewable natural resources hurt Cheyenne Enterprise as much as it hurt white traders. As such, Indians were drawn into the American capitalist free trade system. As early as 1847, a prospective Yellow Wolf told 2nd Lieutenant James W. Albert on scientific reconnaissance at Bent's Fort that, quote, in a few years, they, the buffalo, would become extinct, and unless the Indians wish to pass away also, they will have to adopt the habits of the white people, end quote. By 1855, the Indian agent for the Upper Arkansas estimated that more than 11,000 Indians on the southern and central plains were killing roughly 112,000 buffalo annually, or 10 animals per person. For Cheyennes, the estimate of annual buffalo kill was 13 to 1. The southern Cheyennes numbered around 3,000 by 1855. According to one government estimate, they were annually killing 25,000 deer, 3,000 elk, 2,000 bears, and 40,000 buffaloes. Estimates average 6.5 buffalo per person per year, leaving a large excess for both the local meat trade and robe trade that was funneled to Eastern and European markets. At least one historian has concluded that this excess, especially the supple hides of cows, which reduced reproduction rates, helped make buffalo far scarcer by the 1860s than the legendary hordes of animals that blackened the plains. By this time, the Cheyenne's physical world had declined to the point that changes were becoming more visible to them. A cholera epidemic in 1849 and 1850 largely ended trade with whites except for gun running. Yet another virulent epidemic broke out in 1866 and 1867. War erupted in earnest in 1864 with the, quote, civilizing ambitions of the newly arrived Colorado Empire builders. In the space of about 30 years, the physical landscapes and the plants and animals that once nurtured humans led the Cheyennes to a place even more significant on the spiritual aspects of the remaining landscapes and resources. Between 1840 and 1868, other factors added significantly to the environmental stress. From 1841 to 1859 alone, over a quarter of a million emigrants made their way up the Platte Valley headed to Oregon or after 1848, to the gold regions of California. California emigrants accounted for 185,000 persons between 1849 and 1852. Then in 1859, by some estimates, 100,000 gold seekers made their way across the heart of Cheyenne country. They moved along the North and South Platte, Smoky Hill, and Arkansas rivers to the new strikes in what would soon become the Colorado Territory. According to some accounts, the immigrants contributed to the decline of buffalo along the trails and river valleys by shooting them, often for sport. More likely, immigrants scared the animals away from customary wintering grounds along the sheltering river courses. This disturbance added to their decrease through weakness and starvation in times of harsh weather and increased the animal's susceptibility to bovine diseases carried by immigrants' livestock. In addition, trail traffic trampled precious winter grasses along adjacent rivers and eroded the soil so that the plant's root systems would sprout less biomass each year. Firewood along the streams of the trails became scarce by 1860. Further, 
By 1850, a slow but steady warming period that marked the end of the so-called Little Ice Age produced an extended period of drought on the plains that lasted through most of the 1860s. During that decade of climate change, the great numbers of buffalo in Nebraska and Kansas were moving from old habitats and concentrated in shrinking but still viable microhabitats. By the time of the Medicine Lodge Treaty, buffalo still appeared to be fairly numerous in these microhabitats because of their concentration, even though they were less than eight years from near extinction. One of the most functional of the remaining summer range microhabitats was the borderland of Nebraska and Kansas. On the short grass prairie of the High Plains, the Colorado Gold Rush brought by several estimates, 100,000 people in 1859, each with an average of two grazing animals. The migrants clear-cut much of the remaining timber along the North Platte, South Platte, Smoky Hill, and Arkansas rivers. A full stagecoach service to Denver began in 1859, and by then, freighters were hauling an average of 50,000 tons of goods to Denver City annually. The numerous draft animals required to sustain the new Pikes Peak settlements not only trampled vegetation on the trails, but also their owners pastured them in the river basins in the winter and on the short grasses in time of mild weather, adding a third grass consumer competing with buffalo and horses. Travelers in the late 1850s reported that retreating buffalo herds were concentrating in large numbers, mostly along larger rivers roughly east of the 101st meridian. Within a couple of years of the settlement of Denver, few buffalo roamed within 150 miles of the new city. Although in the early 1860s, a generous herd still plied a winter microhabitat on the headwaters of the Republican River and its Arica Free Fort in northeastern Colorado Territory. Landscapes also became altered by weeds, invasive plants from seeds brought inadvertently in the soles of immigrant boots, and by succession growth that survived dry conditions in overgrazed grasslands before new sod could form. Most noticeable on the short grass prairies by the 1860s, these gradual changes in flora often prevented the growth of new trees, thus limited the replenishment of wood for both natives and white travelers. Consequently, after the Colorado Gold Rush, the buffalo herds moved eastward to the mixed grass prairies for longer periods. They moved toward the westward advancing white settlements in Kansas following statehood in 1861 and Nebraska in 1867. The changing physical landscape altered the social patterns of the humans who used them. This was especially true of the Southern Cheyennes, who found themselves in a vice between the westward advancing agricultural settlements that were exploding after the Civil War and the growth of the Colorado economy in great need of an agricultural hinterland in the short grass tablelands east of the settlements. The spread eastward of agricultural settlements in Colorado Territory now blocked the ecologies of the Upper Arkansas, the Platte systems, and the Republican River area. Cheyennes depended on these river systems for winter hunting. Geopolitical changes of the whites also polarized traditional Cheyenne society and rearranged its authority structure. With the first trade at Bent's Fort, a distant memory by the 1860s, the matrilineal bands along the Arkansas saw accommodation with whites in Colorado Territory as the only way to survive once the Colorado buffalo herds moved far too east from the upper Arkansas Valley. Chief Yellow Wolf by then was in his 80s, and the southernmost Cheyenne clans or bands were now under the guiding influence of Black Kettle of the Wutapio clan. The upper Arkansas River bands were steadily shrinking in numbers by then, as the buffalo remained farther east in north-central Kansas and south-central Nebraska in summer, and in the cooler Republican Valley or the more temperate middle stretches of the Arkansas in western Kansas during the winter. With commerce with Colorado traders no longer lucrative, more Cheyenne families followed members of the Dogmen Warrior Society eastward toward the more concentrated buffalo herds. By the mid-1860s, with the realignment of economies on the plains, the traditional council chiefs redefined their roles. Since the beginning of the intertribal horse trade, the council chiefs, wishing to maintain beneficial trade relations, always found it counterproductive to advocate for wars. No longer being facilitators of lucrative trade relations with whites by the mid-1860s, 
it was almost natural evolution for them to transform their roles to what historians have called, quote, peace chiefs. After the Sand Creek Massacre, however, peace chiefs like Black Kettle found themselves trying to mediate something far more urgent than temporary peace, the actual survival of their people. Cheyenne origin stories always emphasize the superiority of the warrior or soldier societies of the Cheyenne nation over the authority of council or matrilineal band chiefs, the peace chiefs. But with the arrival of horses and the fur trade, council chiefs had gained superiority. That power evaporated in the mid-1860s with the changing landscape. By mid-decade, the conflicts between traditional beliefs and the evolutionary roles of peace chiefs made it mostly impossible for them to control the actions of all warriors within their familial bands who followed their fellow warrior society members on raids against tribal enemies. The argument over authority hierarchy fractured the Southern Cheyennes. Those wishing accommodation with whites gathered within the traditional band camp circles of the council chiefs. Those who wished to resist white intrusion gathered with the leaders of the war factions in the military societies, most notably the dogmen. Consequently, the peace chiefs could only speak for peace, for they had no formal authority to declare peace, nor did they have the informal authority to make decisions for the warrior societies or even individual warriors, a political power that whites nevertheless assumed council chiefs should possess. But these hierarchical powers were, by the mid-1860s, virtually impossible for the peace chiefs to attain within Cheyenne society. As early as in Denver of 1864, Black Kettle and other peace chiefs had told territorial governor John Evans that the dogmen had informed them that if the chiefs did not repudiate the Treaty of Fort Wise from 1861 for Colorado Territory, the dogmen would kill them. Evans claimed the peace chiefs feared for their lives. The dogmen were also instrumental in restructuring residential bands by weakening traditional village structure. For centuries, when a man married, he went to live with his wife's band. According to mixed blood George Bent, such was, quote, one of the most fundamental rules of human social life among Cheyennes, end quote. About 1836, with the expulsion from the tribe of a prominent dogman headman, Porcupine Bear, for killing another Cheyenne, the dogmen began establishing a new residential pattern. Most of Porcupine Bear's fellow dogmen decided to go out with him and brought their wives and children with them. These exiles soon formed a new patrilineal band in defiance of Cheyenne custom. As contact with whites in Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado increased, the dogmen's numbers swelled as more warriors from traditional bands joined them with their families. Cancel chiefs such as Bull Bear, Tall Bull, and White Horse were also dogmen, transferred their roles to the warrior society, and helped transform the dogmen into this new non-traditional clan. The dogmen were also responding to the changing utilization of the prairie by whites, especially the building of permanent military forts that consumed large quantities of wood and other natural resources along the primary roads. Especially aggravating was the presence of newly built forts such as McPherson and Wallace in 1866. The dogmen, like the buffalo, were concentrating in a central region extending south to the Smoky Hill River and north to the forks of the Platte and Blue Rivers and their well-watered tributaries during summer, then making the spur to the Republican tributaries as far south as the Erickery Fort in Colorado during the winter. Some warriors returned to their traditional bands along the Arkansas in winter and mixed with peace factions. The peace factions remained along the Arkansas in winter, but farther east near Fort Dodge. Due to the degradation of the grasses near the major trails, not only buffalo, but dogmen and white settlers were moving into the same choice lands for abundant streams and prime summer buffalo ranges between the principal east-west roads in Nebraska and Kansas. But so too were the Northern Cheyennes, some escaping the Bozeman Trail War of 1866 through 1868 and bringing hostilities south in alliance with the dogmen. Arapahoes, Brules, and Southern Ogallala Lakotas, Pawnees, Odos, Osages, and even occasionally some Kiowas and Comanches pressed into the same concentrated habitats. 
North Central Kansas and Southern Nebraska by the mid 1860s had become a convergence ground or a neutral zone among both allied and enemy tribes as the integrity of the grasslands along the roads and rivers surrounding this rich resource environmental circle gradually collapsed around it. Hunting pressure now grew more concentrated, intense, and competitive than ever before. Especially powerful was an informal alliance formed in the 1860s between the southern factions of Ogallalas in Nebraska under Chief Pawnee Killer and northern Cheyenne followers of the warrior Roman Nose, who came south as the lands north of the Platte became almost untenable and devoid of buffalo. They joined with the dogmen. With two railroads passing through this area, bringing homesteaders misled by land boosters, the whites and the coalition of three tribal groups soon crashed headlong into one another. By the end of 1867, newspapers in both Kansas and Colorado referenced the Northern Cheyenne-Lakota Alliance simply, if ethnologically incorrect, as the dogmen. In the heart of this comparatively still functional biome was the, quote, deadline of Wakanda Springs in Mitchell County, Kansas, and along Pawnee Trail in Nebraska, end quote. The tribes had not yet seen most of these changes at the Medicine Lodge Treaty Council in October of 1867. Although many reporters had seen interpreter George Bent in heated conversation with the dogmen chiefs at the Medicine Lodge Treaty Council grounds, No record exists of the words that passed among them, but Bent's words must have been persuasive. For once, the dogmen chiefs signed the treaty, undoubtedly believing that they could continue to live and hunt north of the Arkansas until the buffalo became extinct. They were aware of the diminishing numbers of buffalo, but the concentrated pockets of abundant animals in the shrinking ecosystems led the natives to believe the herds in north-central Kansas and south-central Nebraska would last for some time to come. This would be especially true if the government did not allow whites to move into the area before the buffalo were gone, a faulty assumption to be certain. The dogmen were determined to control this region over the other tribes during the summer months when the buffalo were present in large numbers. Indeed, the buffalo were still crowded into that region. About this time, probably 1867, a herd of buffalo delayed construction of the Union Pacific Railroad in Nebraska and the Eastern Division Railroad in Kansas one day from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m., a phenomenon soon depicted in paintings and lithographs. As late as 1871, at the beginning of the great concerted buffalo slaughter, professional hunters reported a large herd on Winter Range north of the Arkansas River in Kansas. Although probably an inflated estimate, the herd was reported to contain 4 million buffalo spread 50 miles deep and 25 miles wide. So, in 1867, as the dogmen understood the council talks, the Treaty of Medicine Lodge would at least buy them some time. Cheyenne's departed Medicine Lodge believing they did not have to be confined on a reservation until they decided to take up permanent homes in the Indian Territory. The Medicine Lodge Council thus produced two treaties, one verbally comprehended by the Cheyennes and the Apahoes, and one understood in written articles by Whites. Neither version was accepted or fully understood by the other party. The verbal assurances were nothing more than exponent paternalism to get important chiefs to sign the treaty. But from the dogmen's perspectives, the Cheyenne chiefs, at least for the time being, had signed nothing away. If the Treaty of Medicine Lodge brought about temporary secession of hostilities in October of 1867, What prompted almost 200 Cheyenne dogmen to resume the war with such vigor in August of 1868? This answer lies not only in the gradual physical changes that had already redistributed the buffalo, but more immediately in rapid overlapping alterations of the landscape of north-central Kansas and south-central Nebraska into middle grounds. These latter changes occurred during the nine months between the signing of the treaty in October of 1867 and the renewal of raiding and war in August of 1868. The Senate ratified the treaty on July 25, 1868, just two weeks prior to an outbreak of these Cheyennes. The Senate did not officially proclaim the treaty until August 19th, 
This was hardly enough time for the Cheyennes to have realized that their perceived right to move and hunt north of the Platte was not part of the final treaty document. Popular histories have given the impression that these Indians broke the reservation at this time to go to war not just with the Pawnees, as they had intended, but more specifically with whites due to frustrations over not receiving annuities and firearms promised by the Indian Bureau. But there was no reservation prior to the Senate ratification of the treaty. The Indian Bureau had distributed old, mostly obsolete weapons at the signing of the treaty in October of 1867. And the simple, unwritten understanding during this time was that the Bureau would occasionally provide hunting weapons only at its discretion. Many of the Cheyennes wintered along the Arkansas between Fort Larned and Fort Dodge in 1867 and 1868, hunting buffalo that congregated in good numbers on their winter ranges between the Arkansas and Canadian rivers. No one starved that winter. By June, the concentrated herds had moved up into Kansas and Nebraska to their summer ranges, and the Indians fully intended on legally hunting them there, as well as making war on Pawnees, who would often spread out to contest the same lands to hunt for themselves. All the tribes living along and south of the Arkansas were demanding guns and ammunition in 1868. Logically, it may be inferred that many of the old surplus cap and ball weapons distributed in October of 1867 were developing black powder fouling and other mechanical malfunctions, and that ammunition was getting low from the winter hunts. In 1867, General William T. Sherman had outlawed the sale of weapons by private traders to the tribes. In the summer of 1868, because of a largely inconsequential raid on the cause near Council Grove, Kansas, Sherman prevented the Indian Bureau from releasing any more guns from their commissary. Still, traders illegally sold guns to the Indians that winter and spring. Even so, Indians agitated for working guns, and many refused to take annuities until the government issued them. Finally, on July 25th, the day the Treaty of Medicine Lodge was ratified, Thomas Murphy, Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Central District, authorized Edward Wincoop, agent for the Comanches, Kiowas, Cheyennes, and Arapahoes, to issue the needed firearms. Wincoop issued guns to the Comanches and Arapahoes camping near Fort Larned on August 1st and to the Cheyennes on August 9th. On August 10th, 1868, more than 180 Cheyenne warriors assembled on the hills above the Saline River in Lincoln County, Kansas. Raids on recent settlers began on that date. Histiographic misunderstandings of what occurred on that day have shrouded Plains history. But by August 13th or 14th, many of the warriors had swept north into the Solomon River settlement in Mitchell, Cloud, and Ottawa counties. By the time elements of the 7th U.S. Cavalry under Captain Frederick W. Benteen temporarily broke them up, they had killed about a dozen settlers, seized two white children as hostages, whom they later left behind to be rescued as a settler, sexually assaulted several women, and dispersed many settlers as far away as Salina. The Cheyennes of Fort Larned, who left the annuity grounds and went north on August 2nd or 3rd to raid Pawnee enemies, already either possessed old guns from the 1867 distribution at Medicine Lodge or had secured better ones from an illegal trade that winter or spring. But early writers seeking to stereotype Indians as ignoble savages argued that the Cheyennes wanted these guns for the purpose of making raids on white homesteaders. This was an illogical assumption, given that the Cheyennes and Arapahoes believed that they were still their lands until the buffalo were gone, and that they had every right to roam north to the Platte from the Arkansas, where they thought that the whites would still be few. Although their advantage was shrinking rapidly, the Cheyennes and Arapahoes still held a balance of power and population in 1867 and 1868. They did not know that many whites, ignorant of verbal assurances given to the Indians, had moved into the Saline and Solomon Valleys since October's treaty signing. The Cheyennes and Arapaho viewed the Arkansas and Platte Rivers as meaningless borders for hunters who move seasonally above and below those rivers to follow the buffalo migratory patterns. With Cheyennes and Arapahoes camped near Fort Larned and Comanches and Kiowas below the Arkansas, the concentration of Indian hunters had created immense hunting pressure on the winter ranges during the winter of 1867 and 1868. 
This forced buffalo to move earlier than usual in the spring into the north central Kansas and southern Nebraska riverine ecosystem. By midsummer 1868, the herds were between the Platte and Smoky Hill rivers, providing larder for newly arrived white homesteaders. According to one newly arrived white settler, Olive Clark, homesteaders were organizing communal hunts of buffalo. Quote, it was great sport. All animals killed on the hunt would be butchered where they fell. The carcasses would be left on the prairie, and I have seen the prairie white with their bones bleaching in the sun, end quote. Another new homesteader, Mr. Earhart, meanwhile remembered killing 92 buffalo in one day when he only wanted to procure a little tallow. In addition, the railroads were by now well on their way into western Kansas, western Nebraska, and eastern Colorado by the summer of 1868, and the herds provided abundant meat for the construction crews. Soon, eastern sportsmen would follow in railroad passenger cars, wantonly killing the animals on the very eve of the professional slaughter. But enough animals still roamed summer ranges in the central part of the region to give a visual impression to the Cheyennes and others that their sacred landscape still possessed spiritual power and thus cultural reciprocity between humans and animals, and that therefore the buffalo remained far from extinction. It would be counterintuitive to insist that the Cheyennes and their allies went to war again in the summer of 1868 simply due to a visual impression of the imminent extinction of the buffalo, even though the animal's overall numbers were diminishing at a steady rate. The U.S. Army believed the buffalo were still present in sufficient numbers to sustain the Cheyenne cosmology and economy for the near future and thus potentially delay white western expansion. Although historians have argued the Army's denial of the official written policy regarding the systematic destruction of the buffalo on the Central Plains, military correspondence from this time is rife with Sheridan's and Sherman's determination to do just that by waging the same kind of total war they had successfully accomplished during the Civil War. Destroying enemy property and food supplies was the objective. Like the Indians, the army could not visualize the end of the buffalo quite yet, at least not without their help. Hostilities resumed in 1868 after Sheridan assumed command of the military department of the Missouri. He wrote Sherman, quote, The best way for the government is to now make them poor by the destruction of their stock and then settle them on lands allotted to them, end quote. Sherman wholeheartedly agreed to this policy. He believed incorrectly, that there were enough buffalo between the Platte and the Arkansas to last the Indians for 20 years. By early fall, Sheridan had ordered six companies of infantry and two companies of cavalry under Lieutenant Colonel Luther B. Bradley to clear the Central Plains microhabitat of concentrated buffalo. Bradley found few animals as they had migrated to winter range and thus he accomplished little to infuriate the Indians. What did, however, likely infuriate the Indians was the sight of cultivated fields, domestic livestock, and permanent farms that had not previously been present in such numbers, especially in Kansas, prior to the treaty signing. Small white trade centers that sustained native hunting and trade customs in the 1830s and 1840s were one thing, but widespread agricultural expansion transforming the prairie was quite another. Much of the increase in white settlement in north-central Kansas and Nebraska occurred during the nine months following the Treaty of the Medicine Lodge. In the mid-late 1860s, Kansas organized most of the counties that would be affected by resumption of warfare in 1868. But the big push came from late fall 1867 through the summer of 1868, when most Cheyennes stayed out of the region for the winter, surprisingly remaining absent into August. According to one early historian, a tide of immigrants, including colonies of European homesteaders, swept into the region through Salina at this time. Within two years, the census of 1870 would reveal an increase of 8,000 homesteaders in the new counties alone. By the end of the 1860s, the Federal Land Office recorded that settlers filled on more than 6 million acres in Kansas after 1862. The 1870 census further revealed statewide population growth of 239% and an increase in population density from 1.3 persons per square mile to 4.5. 
In Nebraska, the 1860 census revealed a combined population of 3,106 in Kearney, Saline, and Knuckles counties, which would soon be in the hot zone of Cheyenne activity after Medicine Lodge. Adams, Franklin, Hamilton, and Webster counties, organized in 1867, only reported a population of 191 in 1870 due to the Indian War, while Kearney County reported a population loss of 830, down from 874 in 1860, to 47, largely due to the war. In Lincoln and Mitchell counties in Kansas, which witnessed much of the violence in the late summer and fall of 1868, settlers by fall of 1867 were pushing beyond the official survey lines even before some of the counties were officially organized in 1870. This push carried settlement beyond the Cheyenne deadline at Wakanda Springs. What the Cheyenne saw was a much larger mosaic of dreaded farms and buffalo range, old and new landscapes intermixed, economically incompatible, and competing for supremacy. In a remarkably short space of time, the landscape of north-central Kansas, later followed by south-central Nebraska, had undergone transformation into an alarming middle landscape sooner than the Cheyennes had envisioned. Soon, agriculture would predominate, and sooner rather than later, they would have to move to a reservation. The new farms, fields, orchards, and fences that took hold after Medicine Lodge were the principal matters that infuriated the Cheyennes, not the scarcity of buffalo. But the Cheyennes also believed whites would not, or at least should not, speed up the demise of the buffalo by destroying the grass with the plow. Imagine their fury in August as they went north to raid Pawnees and instead gazed upon a new settlement on their last summer hunting range. If they did nothing to alter this, the farms would increase in size and numbers and would quickly end the Cheyenne's way of life and belief system. Given treaty assurances in October of 1867, these new settlements constituted a clandestine assault on their political and spiritual flank. Accounts of the violence the Dogmen and other Cheyennes unleashed after August 10, 1868, proliferated in early newspapers to present a picture of innate Indian savagery. Retribution was harsh and predictable. During and after the 7th U.S. Calvary's Washita and Sweetwater campaigns in Indian Territory, where many of the natives wintered in 1868 to 1869, non-combatant Indian women and men suffered as assuredly as white civilians did in the late 1860s. The Republican River Expedition and the Battle of Summit Springs in 1869 effectively ended the dogmen's military supremacy. By 1870, the vagaries of the Treaty of Medicine Lodge had become concrete conventions imposed by military conquest rather than negotiated agreement. This soon impoverished the Southern Cheyennes and Arapahoes as they attempted to adapt the concepts of their spiritual universe to an impossible environment at Darlington Agency, Indian Territory. Settler colonialism thereafter engulfed the Cheyennes and Arapahoes. It is a condition they continue to deal with today, according to educator Henrietta Mann, within all levels of their educational system, secondary schools, tribal colleges, and state universities. Thank you for listening to the Nebraska History Podcast. To learn more about Nebraska History Magazine, to listen to more podcasts, or to support our podcast by becoming a member of History Nebraska, go to history.nebraska.gov slash podcast. Until next time, for History Nebraska, I'm Chris Goforth. Now you know you